This video is brought to you by ASRock and the Riptide Motherboard Series B550 or X570. These are smart economical choices for Ryzen 5000 series CPUs. It's a 10 power phase, you know, DigiPower driver MOS implementation with 50 amp drivers and 60 amp coils. It's got a primary PCI Express 4.0 x16 slot, PCI Express 4 M.2, ample USB connectivity. I mean, there's 10 USB 3.2 Gen 1, four front, six rear, eight USB 2.0, six front, two rear. Also got USB type C headers for the front, a killer E3100 2.5 gigabit LAN. This motherboard has a surprising amount of features for the price point that it comes in at. Be sure to check out the ASRock Riptide series, B550 and X570 versions, and on with the video. All right, we're back again with the tie-in transport. Remember this thing? It's two rack units, but it's actually four epic sockets, four independent machines in half of one U. So originally I set this thing up with some Intel U.2 drives, four of them and some memory and some Optane storage and VMware. So be sure to check out our old video on that. And that went pretty well. But I discovered some things with VMware. For one, I had a dual 10 gig interface. Dual 10 gig, that's the Intel X550. It's not bad. But when you're running something like VMware vSAN, VMware doesn't really do a lot with data locality. You're running a virtual machine on one of these servers, but the data is actually stored somewhere else. Well, you're gonna be limited to wire speed. In fact, I dug into it. VMware doesn't actually recommend 10 gig for vSAN. Minimum 2x 25 gig, minimum. And I kind of believe it. 25 gig is actually pretty affordable. I was able to get some fiber optic 25 gig cables and that was on eBay and that was just for a few bucks each. Uh, well, I did have to buy about 40 and they were about $10 each when I got 40. So I've got some extras. Maybe I'll put those on the level one store, I don't know. But uh, I also had to get some different 25 gig ethernet adapters. These are actually Mellanox Connect X4s. These are actually older cards and this is an OCP2 interface. So it leaves my two half height PCI Express expansion slots free because this chassis actually has two X16 PCIe slots on either side that are half high. So I could put you know 100 gig adapter or something like that in there. This adapter is two 25 gig interfaces but it really tops out at about 35 or 40 gigabit. This is really meant to be like a, a primary and a backup and not really a true dual 25 gig adapter. But for our purposes, dual 25 gigabit is a heck of a lot better than dual 10 gigabit. So I'm gonna swap out those dual 10 gig adapters for dual 25 gig, gig adapters. And of course our switch up there, that's the Dell S5212-F or F-ON. You actually are meant to run two of these in tandem. So that again goes with the redundancy. One 25 gig port would go into one Dell switch. The other 25 gig port would go into the other Dell switch. Those switches will be linked with at least one 100 gigabit connection, although you can link them with up to 300 gigabit connections. But I've actually got another server over here that is uh, connected at 100 gigabit with a Mellanox Connect X5. That is gonna be in a different video for another time. This is actually the ultimate solution, I think, for XCPNG, as suggested in the title. We're building an XCPNG cluster. I'm gonna go ahead and take care of that bottleneck. Yes, that would help us with VMware vSAN as well, but XOSAN V2 is coming out for XCPNG. That's gonna be in another video. This is just the ultimate XCPNG setup where I've got four epic sockets in 2U with all the memory and plenty of local storage. Now I've upgraded my storage as well. I got some Kyoxia U.2 drives on eBay. These were just about $100 a terabyte. And these are four terabyte, these are great drives. They perform really, really well. You may have seen those in some other videos. Uh, Kyoxia sort of turned me on to those. Uh, they sent me a 1.6 terabyte. And so I've outfitted this thing with uh, four four terabytes and I've got four blades. So I've got a couple of blades that still use the, uh, the older Intel P4500s. But man, those Kyoxia M.2 are a lot nicer than the older Intel uh, U.2, so... Whew. Man, Tyan really crammed a lot in these. Of course, I'm still using Optane for cache, because this thing runs Linux. I can set this up with LVM and LVM RAID, and then I can use Optane for cache. Now, the testing that I'm going to be doing is with basically local storage. We're not going to use Exosan or Exosan V2. 
we basically just set all this up with local storage because when you're running a cluster with local storage the performance really is incredible it's better than anything that you're going to get from just about any cloud provider solution or any cloud anything unless you're running your solution entirely from ram and i'm hoping that uh, i'll be able to demonstrate a you know fully replicated SAN solution that does something else but just because we're not running a SAN doesn't mean that we can't do continuous high availability and i'll show you that with a mysql server but for now this is the hardware configuration that's the important thing to understand it's a distinction so when we're running a cluster you can pick if you want data replication across all of your nodes which comes at a performance penalty you can store your information on a dedicated SAN. So you can have a SAN appliance and then you can use those 2x 25 gig connections to connect to your SAN with the latency and throughput penalties that come with that. Or you can run an application that does its own high availability. So I mentioned MySQL. One option with this cluster is that I can create multiple MySQL or MariaDB uh, database servers and that database software supports replication on its own. So with XCPNG, I can create multiple instances of the database software on multiple physical hosts in our tie-in transport system. And then if one of these physical hosts go down, the database part of it just keeps on running. Now, XCPNG, for its part of it, it can if the data is available on another node, it could boot up the VM and make it accessible. So if you were using uh, something to store or something to replicate the data, it would be immediately available. But because I'm using local RAID, I would have to store a backup or store a replica, maybe last night's version on another node. And that's really a suboptimal situation because if I lose a node, you know, the data is up to the minute on that node. It's not, you know, yesterday. And if I boot up the copy of that virtual machine from yesterday, then I lose all of the information that was on that virtual machine between, you know, last night's backup and today. That's why people use things like a SAN to be able to recover up to the minute information. The data is actually more important than the compute, but it comes with a performance penalty. But that's enough talking about that. That's gonna probably be something for another video. Let's actually configure XCPNG. Now the physical interface is on the back of the server now. We've got our two 25 gig SFP28 ports. We've got two one gig ports, and then we've got our one gig management interface. Now because I'm using a separate management network, I'm gonna connect both the management interface and one of the one gig connections to our test switch here. Ultimately, that'll be on separate networks, separate VLANs. But for now, they're just connected that way, and that's all good. I've also preloaded our DHCP server with the MAC addresses of both that primary LAN interface as well as the uh, remote management, the IPMI interface, well, uh, as well as the MAC address for the IPMI. So that those will come up with known IP addresses for one, two, three, four, the same node numbering that's on the front of our chassis. Another configuration change with XCPNG versus VMware. I originally set up VMware to use the micro SD. That's no longer really recommended because most micro SD don't have the endurance to actually run the hypervisor. The ones that I'm using are built for that, but um, I wouldn't recommend it. You shouldn't do that. So there's actually two M.2 ports on board the motherboard. I actually use one for the Optane cache M.2. The other one we're using for the operating system. So I installed some some Keoxia 256 gig M.2 in those, and that's the operating system. And there's no redundancy or anything there. That part doesn't matter. If I really get in a pinch, I can boot this thing off the network in a kind of a recovery console or a USB stick in kind of a recovery console and copy whatever I need to. But, you know, for this configuration, because we're not talking about ExoSAN V2 yet, it doesn't really matter. The thing I love about the XCP NG installer is that it's no nonsense. Would you like to install? Would you like to install with less than two gigs of memory? No, it's, it's fine. We've got like a lot of memory, XCPNG. We'll get through this together. Checking for existing products. Ooh, you're gonna find VMware. Is that gonna weird? It's like, they're gonna yell at each other and it's gonna be like the odd couple, but hypervisor edition. Hey, it doesn't care. Now it does see my other NVMe and it does give me the option for software RAID, but as we did on our last guide video, you don't really need to do software RAID right now. That's really just to let you set up like a RAID 1 mirror for the operating system part of XCPNG. And it does ask you where you want to store virtual machines. Because 256 gig is kind of overkill for the XCPNG stuff, it can use the extra space to store virtual machines. But 
we're not really going to do that. We're just going to install this so that we can add it to the existing cluster. You see, the primary node in this already has XCPNG set up. And I also elected to install the management appliance. You see, the, the hypervisor itself doesn't really do much. So when you install this, it doesn't really do a lot for you out of the box. What you actually have to do is install your first virtual machine, which is a virtual machine that manages one or more XCPNG hosts. And so really, I'm just setting up host number two, three, four, you know, sort of replacing my VMware cluster and a host at a time. Um, and that single management appliance will manage all four of these XCPNG instances. That actually opens up a lot of really cool possibilities, like the ability to migrate a virtual machine from one host to another through the GUI. And because I've moved from a 10 gig interface to a 25 gig interface, well, 2x 25 gig interface, I expect that's going to be a lot faster than it used to be. Especially because Mellanox also has great Linux support, great Linux drivers, and also offloads a lot of the stuff that you normally would have overhead for in a transfer like that. So it's really, it's a win-win-win situation. And that's pretty much it. I, I mean, I gotta pick a time zone and do a couple other things here, but it's basically all there is. And we've got another, another node, another notch in the belt, another node set up and ready to go. Let's do the next node. All right, each of our machines is up and I've got an IP address for each of the IP management interface interfaces. So, from here, we can do everything else that we need to do actually in the web browser. So let's go do that. All right, so here we are at XCPNG, the dashboard. Let's take a look. So it's, it's pretty, pretty standard. We can come down here to the bottom do new server. I've imported three of the four hosts, so I can show you how to import the uh, the other host. So we got one, two, and four. We can look at our host configuration. 48 cores, 128 gigs of memory. Hey, I gotta spread a lot of memory around a lot of hosts. Uh, we can see that there are five storage devices. So it's like, oh, this one's disconnected. The, the one, two, three, four, five. It's not five the way that you think, but you know, hey, there's 10 terabytes of storage here. Can I connect that? Oh, an unknown error occurred. Well, it's because there's some this host, I don't reconfigure the disks, I move them around, so. Ugh. So let's add the other host. I'm gonna turn allow unauthorized certificates on because these are all self-signed certificates. It should come up pretty quickly, but if you've got an error or some other problem, you'll get a problem here and a pool thing won't show up. And so each server is basically its own pool of resources because we're not using Exosan or anything like that. But these are all added, this looks correct. If something goes wrong or you know you in inherited some old configuration, you can just trash these. And you can see that I've messed up my numbering a little bit because I wanted to get my IP addresses just right and I wasn't super consistent with the naming. But that's okay because that's actually gonna be important for a future video. So got all four nodes added and you know we can just you know go home to hosts and click on a dashboard so okay 32 cores so this is a 16 core 32 thread uh, processor in this one I don't have a hundred like a ton of matching processors so the hosts processors are a little different I do have two of the 24 core Milan CPUs 48 and those are super incredible CPUs I also have a couple of uh, 7402p the you know the previous Rome generation uh, processors and I think that one is is here maybe yeah so I've got three nodes that have uh, 24 cores and one node that has 16 cores which is a pretty awesome cluster it's pretty well balanced every single one of these clusters also has four of the four terabyte NVMe now they're not all configured this one is there's nothing that's that's configured here at all but if we go to one of our other hosts Now the thing that we need to talk about here, the point that I need to drive home is that this is local storage. This is local storage on each node. There's nothing shared about this. And if you check the XCPNG documentation, they have this wonderful table of all of the different technologies and whether or not it's shared storage. But shared storage is very important to understand in the context of high availability. It's not just shared storage. There's actually a lot of machinery that goes into making high availability work. Like all of the other nodes have to be paranoid that the node that's actually running the virtual machine 
is running that virtual machine correctly so that they can step in should something go wrong. But the different technologies here are pretty awesome and pretty standardized technologies. But I've got my P4500s and I've got my Keoxia storage set up, but these are not shared. I can use high availability and I can migrate a running virtual machine from one node to another in XCPNG. It will migrate both the disk and the memory. The problem happens is if a node goes down unexpectedly and the storage pool is unavailable. And the reason the storage pool is unavailable is because it only exists on the one node. All right, so the only virtual machine that I've got running is this actual web server virtual machine. This provides the interface that you're looking at. And so if it gets wonky or squirrely, then uh, our web interface stops working. Uh, it's currently running on the machine that's labeled XCP2. So what I can do is I can hit migrate here and I can pick a destination host, at least one that's got storage. And they can see how much free RAM and that kind of thing I have there. I'm gonna hit that. And I can also pick the network that I want to use for migration. Now, ideally, you want to use the 25 gig network for the migration. That has to be set up ahead of time. Now, notice that it turns uh, yellow here, but I can still click on it and I can still do stuff. The virtual machine isn't paused or, or anything like that. So, you know, we can see yesterday that I rebooted it and did some other stuff, but, you know, it's still running here. We can go to tasks. And we can see, hey, what's going on with this task? And this virtual machine is being migrated. The really awesome thing about this is that it migrates both the storage and what's in memory, like what's in RAM. So this virtual machine isn't rebooted or restarted or paused or anything like that because the node that we're migrating from is online enough to facilitate this migration then the people that are using this virtual machine, in this case us, I mean, this virtual machine is literally the thing that's drawing the percentage increase there. Uh, everything continues to work. It's a live migration, even though we don't have storage. Now, this has been a really quick look at XCPNG. It's probably a hypervisor system that has flown under your radar. And the important thing for me here is not, you know, step-by-step -step how-to, but to get you thinking about it the right way. The XCPNG documentation is very good. It's just that, you know, it's got some yellow exclamation points around High availability, you need to really understand how it works. And you know, don't just use it lightly. You need to really you know, do your homework. Uh, Lawrence Systems also has done some video walkthroughs of the documentation to really help you. But I wanted to really connect the dots because just because you don't have shared storage doesn't mean that you can't also have high availability if your software supports it. And also sometimes, you know, if you don't know how this works and you use the XCPNG GUI, you can set high availability on a virtual machine. You can even migrate a running virtual machine without rebooting it the way that we did from one node to another without shared storage. The problem is that, you know, if you lose access to the storage, you lose access to the VM unless you have a replication mechanism somewhere. Ideally, that's XOSAN, but you don't have to use XOSAN. You can use other technologies that are in shared storage in the XCPNG documentation. Um, and that's where the whole 25 gigabit connection needs to be. But here's the really amazing thing. At the database system, you know, that's that's an example that I picked deliberately because a database running from shared storage is a suboptimal performance. It is a much, much, much better performance situation running a database virtual machine on all four of our nodes. So we're running four virtual machines that doesn't actually have high availability in a sense from the XCPNG standpoint and also not using shared storage. The database software takes care of replicating our data onto all four nodes locally. So if I've got a one gigabyte database, it's actually gonna take up one gigabyte of space on all four nodes, four gigabytes total. The database server handling the high availability is the best case scenario for uptime and availability versus what the hypervisor gives us. Of course, not all software is built like that, and so, you know, you take what you can get as far as availability goes. But for web servers, database servers, and a lot of things that were built to handle a lot of people hitting them, you're better off handling the high availability at the software side than relying on the hypervisor to do it in the first place. I see a lot of posts on the Level 1 forum that are focused on high availability in their hypervisor solution, be it XCPNG or VMware or whatever, and sort of glossing over that, yeah, Microsoft SQL Server can do this, Terminal Services can do this, Apache and Nginx load balancing stuff can do this, uh, you know, in terms of high availability and load balancing and tolerating a 
a node failure in a cluster without having to resort to shared storage. Now, shared storage has its place. This is not a campaign against shared storage, but it's important to me that you understand those things. If you're just looking for a guide or a how-to, well, we get the level one guide on installing XCPNG. There's also really good guides on the internet. You can check out Lawrence Systems guides uh, and guide videos. I'm sure we'll have some of our own, but this hopefully sets the tone, one, to talk about Exosan V2, which is a huge generational leap in technology. It's gonna maybe give us a little bit of the best of both worlds in terms of being able to use a local read, you know, the, the, the local, I don't really call it a cache, but like the local read copy of the data that's stored locally on this node, while also shipping rights to remote nodes, which is kind of a best case scenario in terms of performance. It's that locality of data when you really start to think about it. But also, Exosan V2 can give us some extra options in terms of remote replication and some other really cool features that are only available on the highest end enterprise SAN. So if XCPNG was flying under your radar, you definitely need to pay attention to it because they've come a long way in very short order and I'm very impressed by what I see and I'm very impressed with this cluster setup on our tie-in transport, which is pretty awesome. So this won't be the last that you see of this. Uh, got some other stuff to take a look at. I'm Wendell, this is Level 1. I'm signing out and you can find me in the Level 1 forums. Mm -hmm.